the Lord. Hallelujah to God be the glory. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. We want to welcome all of you who are watching via the internet. And those of you who are here with us this morning, we know that it is very cold outside, but thank God for his precious Holy Spirit who shall warm our hearts. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's enter into his presence right now. Father, we bless your name, O God, and we thank you for this day, God. We thank you, Father, even for this first Sunday of the year, Lord. We are able to be in your presence, O Father, in this wonderful sanctuary, O God. May your name be glorified in our midst this day, God. We thank you, Father, for all the promises that you have made, O God, even for this new year, O God, for they are yea and amen, and we bless your name, O Father. So we enter in this morning, O God, with thanksgiving in our hearts, O Father, and a song of praise and worship upon our lips this morning, God, and we want to worship you, Father, with every fiber of our being, and we want to worship you in spirit and in truth. Enable us to do so this morning, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord, and God's people say, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, let's bless the wonderful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, if you know the Lord is good, give him a big shout right now. Hallelujah. Give him glory, give him honor. Give him the fruit of your lips right now. Give him thanks and praise unto his wonderful name. Hallelujah. Come on, 
singers.
sing this one more time. You're the best. i 
Let's sing. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my death.
all who are named in the name. Cry unto me and obey when I give you instructions. And then you shall see the victory. Without him, I can do nothing. Without him, I'll surely fail. Without him, I would be drifting. Like a ship without a sail, but with him I can do all things. With him I'll never fail. With God. Yesterday, today, forever. Jesus, you are the unchanging. All may change. But Lord, you are the unchanging one. And therefore, you tell to the people, you're not consumed. You are unchanging in your love, even though we change the days of the calendar and the years. But you remain unchanging everlasting, eternal. And it's in your nature, God, to be gracious and kind and merciful. It's in your nature, oh God, who you are, that you are. And we come recognizing that you are a God of justice and equity, a God of love and mercy, a God who is so good that we have tasted, even as the psalmist says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we have come here to worship you. You have seen us through another year. And now, Lord, as we stand right in this first Sunday of this new year, we take this time, Lord God, to worship you and to acknowledge you. And soon, oh God, we would be celebrating the awesomeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be, have, to be able to have an encounter, an intimate encounter with you. That, Lord God, in our spirit, soul, and body, we would be touched and refreshed and moved, Lord God, by what Jesus has done for us. To you, Father, we give glory. This morning, God, be with these precious ones that have come out in a very, very cold zero minus temperature, oh God. We just, we realize, Lord, it's not easy outside, but... They have come here, oh God, to come together to worship you, to come together to honor you, to come together to say that we have come here as a corporate body, oh God. Be with them and every need and a situation each one is going through. And Father, those that are on the way, hasten their step. And we pray for these precious ones that watch us by way of television or internet. We just pray for them and be with each one here. We pray, O oh God, for your grace to be manifested, O oh God, in our community, in our nation, and across the world. And as we pray, O oh God, for peace, O oh Prince of Peace, in the troubled times in which we live, give us grace and let your peace prevail. And again, thank you. Lord, we lift up so many prayers, precious ones in prayers at the 7 and 8 o'clock, and we just lay hands upon these precious ones that need healing and grace today. And we pray, God, let your word reach out and touch them and heal them. And the many, oh God, that needs your presence in the time of loss and grief, we lift them up to you as well. Thank you again for this moment together. Prepare our hearts to be able, oh God, to partake in the communion. And Lord, help us as we come to be 
cognizant of your presence and to know that you are here. Touch lives, touch people today and take charge, Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' precious name. God's people said, amen and amen. Give the Lord a clap offering. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. We've come here to worship, so let's do that right away and give Lord all the glory and honor. Amen. I'm just going to ask Brother Moses to come on up at this time. Amen. As you know, at Thanksgiving, we had the opportunity to feature some of our brothers and sisters right here in Highland that have done recording projects and this is a selection from Brother Moses' recording project. Amen. Praise the Lord.
So is forgiveness in the Lord. Amen. And his mercy endureth forever. Give the Lord a clap offering. <laughs> Particularly when we think of what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. Let's take this moment to think about his goodness and all that he has done. And let's just focus upon the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a moment is time that we can gather here this morning and break bread and to be able to know that all that God has done for us is evident in the cross through Jesus. And that's why we have come here to worship the Lord and, and this aspect of communion is also a sense of worship. And we want to give thanks to God for the forgiveness of sin, for salvation and for healing, all that is in there in the benefits of the cross. This is the Lord's table and this is uh, for those who know him. You could be a, coming to this church. You could be a member of the church. But if you do not know the Lord, please, may I say, you've got to know God as your father through Jesus and to have a personal relationship. And for all those who know him, it is important that you be part of this wonderful supper. Let's break bread and to enjoy his presence and his love and his warmness. Can we do that right now? Let's open our heart to be op to open to what God is about to do even in our spirit as we taste and see that the Lord is good in what he has done in Jesus' name. Amen.
There is a fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sin has plunged beneath the blood lose all. We thank you, Lord, for this time, Father, that we are able to, even this first Sunday of the year, Lord, to look back over 2,000 years, O God, at the sacrifice of the cross. We bless your name, O God, and we appropriate to ourselves this day, Father, all the benefits of the cross, O God, salvation, healing in every area of our lives, Lord God. As we partake of this bread and drink of this cup, O Father, we do so with thanksgiving, and looking ahead to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we partake of this. Amen. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God he came. Thank God for his mercy and goodness. Take this moment just to meditate and reflect. Think and thank God for the cross and for the Father's love before we be seated. Let's sing this song again. Ever since my birth, I saw the street. Ever since by faith, Redeeming love has been my thing. Redeeming love has been my thing. And shall be till I die. And shall be till I die. And Thank you so very much, Father. Thank you so much for the fountain filled with blood, for your mercy through Christ our Lord. God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated. Give the Lord a clap offering. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord. Just before the end of the year, there was a refrain that I could pick up even in deep sleep. Two words particularly, goodness and mercy. And I had to insert that long after the nods had been given. And I felt this would be the beginning of a theme of God's goodness and mercy. Particularly when you think in terms of how you define God and when you also think how goodness and mercy personifies God. You know the psalmist is constantly saying, oh give thanks for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. 
And not only is a refrain, but you find this in 26 verses of chapter 120, 136 of Psalm. Is mercy endured forever? Is mercy endured forever? Is mercy endured forever? It seems like no matter what changes, God's mercy and his goodness endure it to all generations. Fashions comes and goes, trends come and go. In fact, ideas and ideologies come and go, and people in power come and go, but God is unchanging. That's why we're not consumed, and his mercy and his goodness endures forever. What a powerful, wonderful God that we can come to celebrate him. And he personifies what is mercy and what all of the, his goodness is. That's who God is exactly, not only the way in which love is God and God is love. The same thing is when you think in terms of the attributes of our God. So let me, before going into the nine different uh, notes that you have or the titles, the most important is let's define goodness and mercy. When you turn to Exodus chapter 33 and listen to what it says in verse 18. You know, Moses had come to the Lord up on that hill and in verse 17 he said, I will do this thing also thou hast spoken for thou hast found grace in my sight that I know thee by name. Now in verse 18 he's saying, Lord, I beseech you that you would show me your glory. Now that is something that Moses is asking of the Lord. No one has seen the glory of God. No man has seen the glory of God and lived. And we have done the subject. It is innocent. It's just simply cannot be completed. It's large and voluminous when you think in terms of in very many description of glory that is found all the way from Genesis to the last of the book of the Bible in the book of Revelation. And so when you think in terms, show me your glory, you're taking a big risk, Moses, to ask God to show you his glory. But you would have imagined maybe God would come up and jump in and say, okay, this is it. In my judgment, in my severity. Oh, what about in all the amazing aspect of his splendor and all of the angels bowing down in his holiness? That is true. But how could you bring into definition what Moses is asking, show me your glory. Maybe it could be in what we had seen earlier in the book of Exodus. Earthquakes, lightnings, thunder. For these are what you would call comes about as God's glory is displayed. On a sense of an ominous, awesome crescendo of voices, exalting him. Or we could say high and mighty, and no one is high and mighty than God. But the way in which he reveals to Moses is glory. And I want you to turn with me to verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to thee and I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. I will make all my goodness pass before me. But what Moses was asking the glory and the definition that God uses in trying to show the glory of God to Moses, and there is a lot to do with the glory studies and, and studies of it. We could never exhaust all of it. But here God is making it simple. I will make all my goodness pass before you. So if we were to take all of the glory of God and put it in one word, it is the goodness of God. And the Bible has a whole lot to do with his goodness. 
and a whole lot to do with his grace and a whole lot to do with his mercy. And as I began to think in terms of his goodness and mercy, I can say that for myself, but for his goodness and for his mercy, where would I be? I realize it's only his goodness and it's only his mercy that I stand before you. And as I begin this year, I realize it's but God keeping me, keeping everyone, keeping this church, keeping the staff, keeping you. It is but his goodness. It is but his mercy that we're not consumed, that we're not destroyed. You know, thank God we didn't get what we deserve. Grace is undeserving. Mercy is undeserving. And he gave to us what we don't deserve. He gave us grace and he gave us goodness. Fidget Nanus, I may mispronounce his name, a Norwegian oceanographer. He went down north to the Atlantic Ocean to measure the depths of that great ocean. He carried all the apparatus and came down to that particular place and let down what would be the plumb line. And as he let it down, he wrote in his journal, much more. And then he tried attaching that to another extension of rope and he came back the next day much more. And he tried that the next day and the following day until he exhausted all the ropes he had. And finally the last bit he could get, he said, let's send the plumb line and measure what the depth of this ocean is. And finally he wrote, need much more. If you were to measure the plumb line of God's goodness and grace, it's much more than we can even imagine. What much more than what we can think. The Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. Show me your glory, Lord. How could a man utter the glory that even angels want to look into it and they bow down? And here God says, I will hide you in a cliff of the rock. I will make my glory, my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim. And God is proclaiming his name before Moses. And he will be gracious to whom he will be gracious. And he will be merciful to whom he will be merciful. You know, I want us to turn to what the psalmist is talking about in his own experience. But if you turn with me to Psalm 65, verse 11, listen to how the psalmist is saying. He says here, thou crowns the year with thy goodness and thy path drop fatness. You crown the, the year with your goodness. You know, God has put crowns and you can do a study on the various crowns, but we understand this is something like very important. It is what you would wear on your head. It is of gold of the finest metal studded with the diamonds and gilded and, and designed. It speaks of authority. It speaks about being in power. It speaks about something that is good and powerful. It's something that is ordained for you to proclaim. But what God is saying is, you crown the year, that is what the psalm is saying, with your goodness. So if you could just look at this new year and just get a feeling of this new year, we don't know what will happen. But on top of everything, I want you to do what the psalm says. You crowned the year with your goodness and the cards are dropping with fatness, with the goodies that comes out of the fruits of the field, the crops. Can you envision 
even as we just entered into 2018, that no matter what's going to take place, that God says, I have crowned this year with my goodness. It is a sense of authority. It is a crown that tells us in which you will be positioned to speak the edict under the King of Kings that this year would be monumental. This year for you would be so much a breakthrough in what you're about to do, in what you're about to conceive, in the things that would further bring you to a higher, greater level than ever before because God has crowned this year with goodness. The enemy will want to do everything that is evil, but here is what Joseph said in Genesis 45, 5 as well as in 50 and verse 20. All that you thought evil, God has mended for good. I know for so many it has not been easy. And I understand how difficult it has been for you. You have lost loved one, you're in grief, you're in pain. Others have had challenges of health and challenges in their relationship, in terms of their jobs, in terms of financial situation. How can it be good when you place yourselves with so many across the world? You and I, in spite of everything, have had it good. Because God has been good to us. When you think in terms of everything that God has done, we may not understand it today. But a time will come when we realize that all things, even the setbacks, even what the enemy threw in, have all turned around for our good. All things turn up and add up to be good. Even those minuses and positives. Even the bitter and the sweet has come about at the end to make that beautiful cake, though in the middle of it, it didn't taste neither sweet nor bitter. But when the final product, we look and say, wow, this is tasty. How did you do it? All things work together for good. And God says, I'm going to crown this year. And this is what the psalmist is saying. Yes, you have crowned the year with your goodness. And my cart is overflowing with the fatness of all the best and the finest of all that the land could supply. You see, my friend, when you turn to chapter 65 and verse 1, listen to the way the psalmist is saying, and I want you to note this very carefully. Praise waited for you, O God in Zion, and unto thee shall the vows be performed. Understand this very importantly. The very first, the Lord's day of this year, you have come into the presence of the Lord and you have come to praise him. In other words, what the Psalms are saying in, hold the press, stop. Praise is waiting for the Lord. Praise is on its way to the Lord. It is making its way to the Lord in Zion. And unto thee shall the vows be performed. Do you know what praise wait simply means? It simply means you cannot hold the praise any longer. You cannot hold it any longer. It is coming out. It is coming out. It is coming out. You cannot hold it any further. It's going to come out. You see, two very important truths we need to understand that even David had mentioned. Surely goodness and mercy follows me, overtakes me, chases after me all the days of my life. It is like these cops chasing after you, chasing after you, and then you're hearing the siren and seeing the lights. And mistakenly, instead of pressing the brake, you have pressed in the accelerator and you're zooming away. And then you look back and find out the cop is not just only keeping our speed, but is catching up to you. Now you are frightened. You're wondering what is going on? How will I face? It could be jail time. 
Not just speeding now, just disobedience. And finally they catch up with you and they ask you to open your car and you're sitting there and that's it. And they come with goodies and say, surely goodness and mercy, we just want to give to you. You think that happens? I don't know if it'll happen here. But I know when it concerns God, God's faithful sheep dog chases after you, runs after you with his goodness and his mercy. And even at the beginning of this new year, I want you to do something what is in point number nine. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. How important is this for you to say so? Because you are saying who God is and who God is is what he does. He doesn't do evil. He only does good and he is merciful. It doesn't matter what the enemy has put into your heart, into your mind. Don't attribute to God what is the devil doing. And don't attribute to the devil what God does. God is good and all that he does is good. It goes from the beginning of creation. God said, let there be light, and there was, and he said it was good. God said, let the firmament come forth, and sure enough, and he said it was good. All the way down to creation, up to man. And God saw it was good. Whether it was the first day, or the sixth day, or the seventh day. And what God brought together in the Garden of Eden, it is said it is good. Let me remind you, right from the beginning, it says God is good. Praise waited for you. Praise waits for God because he's good. Don't wait to see the goodness of God. Being to praise him and begin to thank him before you see it. That is found in Psalm 27 and verse 13. Listen, what we need to realize is praise waited for you simply means... He that comes to God must believe that God is the rewarder of all those that seek him. Unfortunately, there are people who are going to seek him, going to come on bended knees, hitting their head on the floor, asking the Lord, Lord, give me some good. Show me mercy with a heart of unbelief. The only way that you can please God is by faith. And even before we go into full swing into this new year, I'm saying this again. Learn what it is to confess, say yes. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. What? Psalm 107. The Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed, and if you've been redeemed, say so, that God is good and his mercy endureth forever. Praise waited for you, Lord. Praise waited for you in Zion and there will also be what I have vowed unto you. Look at what it says in verse two. Thou that hearest prayers unto thee shall all flesh come. Not simply those in the Old Testament where these vows are performed, but all flesh shall come because he hears the prayer of salvation. He hears the prayer of deliverance. He hears the prayer of those that need help. And this morning you could, even as you watch, no matter what time of the day it is, that you can know the goodness of God, ask through Christ that you would see the goodness of God in the land of the living, that you would experience the goodness of salvation the goodness of deliverance because of all what Jesus Christ has wrought on Calvary's cross could be yours, can become a personal experience. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You see, my friend, from verses 1 to 4, it talks about the goodness of God, that God is a God of goodness. Verses 5 to 8 is God is a God of might and power that brings about the answers to your prayer. And from 
verse 8 from verse 9 to verse 11 is a God who wants to bless you. He's a God of blessing, a God of prosperity. He blesses your spirit, your soul, your body, and every aspect of your life. So he says he crowns you with goodness and the cart is overflowing with the fatness of the land. Claim this promise. Listen, there's a problem here that would prevent us, that would prevail against us. That's found in verse 3. Iniquities prevail against me and as for our transgression, how then can I receive the goodness of God? How then can I receive the mercy of God? Because right there is a stumbling block. My iniquities, my failures, my transgression. But thou shalt purge them away. Not a calf or a wolf or any other animals. No, not even what you would bring into the house of God in the Old Testament. When you think in terms of the sacrifices, here is the psalmist specifically saying, the Lord makes atonement for your sin. It's the Lord who purges away your sins and transgression. And the only way in which God's goodness and mercy can be found, it is on the ground of the shed blood of Jesus at Calvary's cross. And God is dealing with our iniquities and our transgressions if we come to him and if we ask his forgiveness. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And God is dealing with anything that keeps us or prevails against us because the Lord himself steps down to purge away our sins. God himself steps down from heaven to redeem us. God himself steps down to make atonement for our sins. And listen to what it says in verse 5. Uh, verse 4. Blessed is the man. The moment you know what Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 talks about in David's life itself as a sense of purging, but he says, blessed is the man whom thou choosest. You are not an accident. And this year is not an accident. God is crowning this year with his goodness and mercy. And you are chosen and you cause it to approach unto God. You can come to the very presence of God and say, Abba, because of what Jesus did. That ye that dwell, that you may dwell in the courts of the Lord. What do you mean courts of the Lord? You don't need someone to advocate. You don't need an Old Testament saint. You don't need some New Testament saints. You can go into the very presence of God in the name of Jesus. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house. God is not asking you to sit in some corridor. He's saying, come over. It's your house. Listen to what the psalmist says in 23 of Psalm and 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He causes you to sit in heavenly places. What is so incredible, my friend, is there have been transgressions and iniquity but God who is rich in mercy, even while we were down with our sins and transgression, Christ died for us and causes us to sit in heavenly places with him. You will be dwelling in the courts even in the most difficult moments of your life. Yes, you will be literally one day in the courts, but every moment you have when you close your eyes in prayer and speak the name of Jesus, you are right in the presence of God. And the Bible says you'll be satisfied with the goodness of his house. What is there in his house is goodness. God is not a killjoy wanting to run after you to chase you, to knock you down and looking to see in any way, in any shape, in any form to hurt you. That is not God. Even of your holy temple, the goodness of your holy temple. Now that is simply says from verse 1 to 4, God is good. 
But listen to what it says. Not only is good, he's mighty to deliver you and to help you through. Because he's a good God. Verse 5. By terrible things, all, all some things, great things, in righteousness will thou answer us. Oh yes, the psalm is saying you are going to answer us. If it calls for a miracle, God will. Because he has pocket full of miracles for you. Listen to what he says. By awesome things, terrible things, great things and righteousness will thou answer us, O God of our salvation. Who are the conference of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea? You could be to the ends and come to the end of your own self. Or far off into the sea, as Psalm 107 says, sinking up and down. But you're going to see the glory of God. Trust the Lord. Which by his strength sets fast the mountains being girded with power. Here's the psalmist giving the imagery as he looks across the landscape. And he sees those mountains girded with power. That no matter what you have gone through, you are here to a new year. And you could have been flaky as everybody else, but God kept you unmoved, unshaken, because you were like a mountain that would not be moved. He's put you like a mountain and girded you with power that you couldn't be shaken out of your blessing, shaken out of your job, shaken out of your family, shaken out of whatever the enemy would desire to do because he girded you with his power. He's a God of might. And listen to what 6 says. Who by strength set it fast the mountains, verse 7, which stilleth the noise of the sea. Oh, yes. The enemy has come to threaten you. Maybe it's a notice from a lawyer. Maybe it's some sort of a letter from the bank trying to foreclose. Or it could be someone trying to tell you, we're going to throw you out of your job. And there was the noise and the tumult, the noise of the ocean that not only is calm but there are times when it is a huge humongous noise drowning us like the tumult of the people that would frighten us but God said still if it had not been for the God stilling the waters and making you strong girded as the mountain with power where would we have been but God has brought us through because he's going to still the noise of the enemy and the tumult of the enemy. That is what God will do because of his great might. And verse 7 goes on to say the awesomeness of this. But in verse 9, 8 he says, They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid of your tokens. Uh, these stand in awe of your signs. What signs? The signs in which he has displayed his might in helping you, being with you. That thou makes the outgoings of the morning and the evenings to rejoice. There would come difficult moment and yet in the midst of it in the morning and in the evening you're going to give thanks to God because nothing has prevailed against you. You are an overcomer through Christ. You are more than a conqueror through Christ. Give the Lord a clap offering. <laughs> Verses 9 to 11 is the blessing that God leaves behind. Listen to what 9 says. Thou visits the earth and waterest it. Thou enriches it with rivers of God, which is full of water. Thou prepares them corn. Thou visits the earth. Last year, more than one person emailed me about something that they found. And I find that also in the Facebook about how this research team has done research to find out that we would be the biggest debtors in the whole world that we would be worse off than what would be third world, that our economy would be shattered and broken, and with everything that's happening in the political and in the financial world, we would come scratched so badly that we wouldn't be able to maintain our houses, there wouldn't be jobs enough for us, forget about jobs for our children, and there's no hope for our grandchildren. It was so bad that as you looked into it and did, those people did the calculations, they know they were the gurus. They know what they were doing. They were the experts. And what they had predicted was the catastrophe that America would never ever had experienced. It would be the worst of times in our generation. 
It, to have, it was to have begun last year that we would be down in the slope and abyss that we can never get back. It would be the worst recession. It would be the worst time. People be jumping out from the 33rd floor. There'll be suicides and there'll be people that would do whatever they could to get something out of somebody because the times are desperate. And that is true. All of the predictions when it comes to global warming, when it comes to financial situation, these are not mere people. They are a couple of PhDs. They have done the best research they could. And in all analysis, we were gone. We were done. We were finished. But then God visits the earth. God visits the earth. And he waters. Where there should have been total famine and pestilence and diseases and such terrible what you would call the worst of the worst financial disasters and meltdown, God just waters it. He greatly enriches with the river of God, the tap of God, the faucet of God was just flowing and flowing and flowing, which is full of water. Thou prepares them corn in a time they said there will not be even grass. There was corn, there was the fruit, there was the cart that is running over. For it is God. That has provided it. Give the Lord a clap offering. He made the predictions which were sure. With the right calculations. But when God visits the earth. Suddenly the equation began to change. Because everyone else against God is no match. When God comes down. That is the glory and the power of God. Give the Lord a clap offering. But not only does he do that, way beyond our expectation. It says here, verse 10, thou waters the ridges thereof abundantly. Come on. The ridges are those are gone a case. Those things don't come back. Business will not come back. Times that have in the past as our parents knew and those that lived earlier knows it's not going to come back. The ridges are gone. But God waters the ridges thereof abundantly. He settles the furrow thereof and makes it soft that was hard. And those grounds that were hard, he makes it soft with showers. You have blessed the springing thereof in places that you would never have experienced. What I mean is a spiritual springing forth. What I mean is a solical springing forth. What I mean is a physical health and strength that springs forth. What I mean is a financial and wealth, welfare programs that will spring forth. What I mean to say is in verse 11. Listen to what it says here. God has crowned the year with his goodness. And that doesn't matter what takes place. You stand up as the priest of God and proclaim the goodness of God, the mercy of God. There was a group among the 12 called the Levites. And then among the Levites was a special force called the sons of Aaron. What was so incredible about them is they would take the holy senses and they would walk in the time of pestilence and death and say, holy, holy, holy. It is for you to stand in the midst of whatever take place and said, blessing, blessing, blessing. He commanded his blessing for generation. You have the right to proclaim the goodness and the mercy and all of the graciousness of God. What is so incredible, my friends, is the path that you make will drop with fatness. Will drop with fatness. And what incredible way in which verse 12 describes the last of, he says, they drop upon the pastures of the wilderness. Maybe you have said, there's no hope in this kid. There's no hope in this fellow. He will never amount to much. He's never finished school. He never finished college. But you have never calculated he's employing people with PhD in his company when God starts a work with him. This boy can never be saved. This girl, there's no hope. Wait till God takes the wilderness and abundant crops will grow. 
because they drop fatness upon the pastures of the wilderness and even the little hills will rejoice on every side. It is incredible. I thought this was wilderness. They were wasted places. Wasted places begin to spring forth because God drops fatness. Because God is giving us this year and crown it with goodness and the path wherever the glory of God, the goodness of God goes, brings forth the best and the finest of the crops. You see, my friend, all of these are imageries of a farmer. But you are not, you and I are not in Gradian society. We are not farmers. So translate it into your own field, whether it be as a student, whether it be in your business, whether it be in your profession, claim Psalm 65. He crowns the year with goodness and the carts are all flowing with so much of the crops and the finest and the best. I want you to realize Psalm 119 and verse 68. Listen to what the psalmist is saying. Thou art good and thou doest good. Teach me thy statutes. Somewhere we get wrong. God does good things. Therefore he is good. You got it wrong. God does good things because he is good. Not because by good things, you say the man is good because of the good things he does. Which means he does evil things too. But good things he does, he's a good man compared to all the evil. There's no evil in God. I want you to know intrinsically in every aspect, because God is good, that is who he is, that is what he does. So in a time like this, confess not only what good he has done for you, that is praise him for his goodness, but worship him for who he is. He is good and his mercy endureth forever. That is his quality. That is his characteristic. That is what he is personifies goodness and mercy. Psalm 33 and verse 5. The earth is filled with the goodness of God. Can you see the earth with the fullness of God? That is what God wants you to proclaim. Psalm 100 and verse 5. God is good and his mercy endureth forever. Let the earth, and that's what Psalm 100 is, a words of worship and praise. So having defined goodness, I'll just go into mercy before we close because the others will finish the next time. I want you to understand mercy is defined in so many ways like goodness. Remember God said, show me your glory. And God let his goodness pass before Moses. And Moses is seeing what you call not the awesome thunder and lightning which would frighten you, but what he forgot to understand, the goodness of God. The goodness of God to his people. And now all of a sudden you're realizing, my God, this is amazing. And yet sometimes you and I wonder why is people saying is an angry God. Let me explain this. When you come to Exodus chapter 34, here is from verse 6 to verse 7, is how God introduces himself, what he proclaims. The Lord passed before him. And the Lord proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in mercy and truth. Let's just underline the many connotation, the many aspect of his mercy. And then just define the other aspect that we sort of blame God. The Lord passed before him and he proclaimed. This is the proclamation of the Lord. The Lord omnipotent. The Lord almighty. Number one. About every other quality. 
What about judgment? What about anger? What about equity? What about his act and say that is, I'm holy. Everything else should be doomed. Number one, top on the list, the Lord, the Lord God Almighty, merciful. There is something wrong with religion. Rigid, religion is a, a poor reflection of God. When you look at religion and religious people in the name of the Lord or name Almighty, benevolent, boom, chop his head off. Where is mercy in that? Where is mercy in people who come with pomp and delight and people have to bow down and kiss their rings and fall down? That is not God. Where did we get the idea that God wants to kill people because they broke some infringement of the law? The number one on the list is not haughty and mighty. The number one on the list is God. The Lord, the Lord God, that is the name of God, followed by who he is. Merciful. Do you see religious people being merciful? Any law that's broken is always the weak, the women who are being killed. You go down to the Middle East and you can get a fraction of what's going on. But in Christendom too, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, another characteristic of mercy, abundant in goodness, abundant in truth. You can't lie about that. The next verse, verse 7, goes on to say, keeping mercy for thousands. Look at the way this is enlarged. Look at the way this mercy is brought into magnified. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgressions of sin, and will by no means clear the guilty. You can throw the holy water, you can put the green flag with what was written from holy scriptures and black flag with all sort of nonsense, but my friend, God is not going to hold you guiltless if you do not seek mercy. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, and third and the fourth generation. Ah, there is God angry. No, what it simply means is God has profusely been merciful and gracious and good until you stretch it and bite his hand and simply start kicking and simply start doing everything that you could imagine until one day God said, listen to me, as a father and as a mother, you would know and I would know. We try to be gracious and kind and ask, we stretch to the limit, but there comes a time we say, no. Understand this, you will be punished for this. Oh, you don't love me because I love you. That is why there's a sense of chastening. I should be concerned for everybody in the world, but far away in some village in China, maybe something is taking place. I know my heart may break, but I'm not on my knees. I'm not trying to do something and weep and cry and, and trying to do justice. That's somebody else's child. But because you are a father, your mother, your children are intrinsically yours, there's a sense in which you want to do so much good and show so much mercy, but you also want to make sure in mercy and grace, once it's exhausted, if the child will do what she or he will, will fall over the cliff, will have an accident, and then comes an anger, a righteous anger. You see, my friend, eight times mercy, grace, long-suffering, all of this is put in eight different words. And then one time God will say the sin. Excuse me? In connection with all that God has done, you just point out the anger. Yes, there is the anger. In fact, Jonathan Edward preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. And I believe that's a good message. And sometimes we should shock the people with that. But that doesn't define God. I want you to understand a bee is not defined by the sting. The bee does sting. If you harass the bee, if you keep running after the bee, the bee really gives honey. That is his job. But you keep troubling the bee, it's going to chase you, it's going to sting. You say, mm -mm, 
you can't do that oh the bee is terrible let's kill it the world will never be the same without the bee but listen a bee gives honey and the bee stings if you try to create harm i would tell you this my friend the dog is a great dog keep kicking him keep kicking him keep kicking him one day he's going to bite your feet off ah this is a dirty dog after 10 years of kicking that dog <laughs> let's put in perspective the dog took it all i want you to understand in a larger greater realm don't play with god god is a god of fire and it's only because of his mercy we are not consumed micah chapter 6 listen to what it says in jeremiah chapter 44 and verse 22 god is speaking to the people of israel he said enough with them and so in jeremiah chapter 44 and verse 22 And so the Lord could no longer bear. He just couldn't handle you all, he says. Because of the evil, your continuous evil doings. And because of the abominations you have committed. Therefore is your land desolation. And an astonishment and a curse without inhabitants as this day. It's because you continue to defy God. And there are those sitting on the street who had the best of opportunity. They didn't take the grace of God. that their parents showed they went out and did what they did and the fact that they sit down there is not because their parents were bad it's simply because they just went way out i'm not talking about all the evil parents i'm talking about parents as is good but just to say there's a sense of response but listen what you find in jesus the fulfillment of god's goodness and mercy and i want you to understand this because i will stress it again next sunday how important no matter what happens to prepare your heart and to mind and to be able to say who god is god is good even though the enemy will throw in things you simply stand up and say god is good and his mercy endure it forever that god is good not only sunday morning but he's going to be good and merciful tomorrow monday and tuesday and wednesday and thursday and friday and saturday and then again sunday morning noon and night endure it forever long after the world is done and finished with god is good and his mercy endure it forever what an amazing way that is found in the fulfillment in jesus you see in we don't need to go there psalm 85 and verse 10 mercy as truth have kissed each other and how does that happen truth is not compromised there was an atonement made and what was powerful is mercy and grace was found goodness was found if you can turn with me to luke chapter 1 and verse 72 listen to what the prophetic the message about jesus luke chapter 1 and verse 72 that is to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant i want you to remind you what jesus did he went about doing good but he also was a man of mercy a man of mercy a man that shows mercy not someone who's a preacher and want to see people knocked down and killed and doomed Every aspect of this savior every aspect of a wonderful lord is mercy 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 if you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 19 listen to what the bible says listen to what he says in this passage Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13 he says i want you to understand what the law is but listen to what the ultimate meaning is you go and learn what it meaneth This is the whole intent in a nutshell I will have mercy and not sacrifice for I'm not called I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance that is the unbelievable aspect of our savior he goes about doing good and he's come with the father's message I will have mercy and that is who he is ultimately what does it mean for us The whole content of this message my friend is get to know God through Jesus and you will know him as a father a true father will love a true mother will love a true father and mother will have mercy and will be able to be pliable and flexible knowing that that grace and mercy and goodness not to say without chastising 
but ultimately it is love and grace and goodness. And that is so important. What do, what do the Lord require of you, O house of Israel? What doth the Lord require you, O church? That is what he has shown. In Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, the prophet is speaking out loud. He has shown the O man what is good. What is good? It is there. Not knocking down people, not jumping over people, not troubling people, all in the name of God. But what is good he has shown you. And what doth the Lord require of you? But to do justly because God is just. But to love mercy because God is merciful. And to walk pompously, high and mighty. No, even our God who is almighty took the shape and the form of a man. Not as a conqueror, but one that is conquered. Even the form of a servant and came and delivered us from our sins. He had shown thee, O oh man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. At the close of this series, I just want us to know this one thing. Mercy, goodness, goodness, mercy. So prepare your hearts, even as the last number nine on your notes will say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I know you've been hurt. I know you went through hard times. Listen to me carefully. Satan did everything to destroy you. Satan did everything to get you off your mind, get you off your money, get you off your house, get you off your family, get to take you off your children. The enemy did everything, but you are here today because God is good and his mercy endure it forever. I'm just going to have the prayer words come in just a moment. We're going to take up an offering in just a moment. I'm going to just touch them and pray for them, but after the offering, I want to do something very important. Why not I do it right now? Because it's important. I want to, I know that you're going to give something to the Lord as your titan offering, but God wants to give to you goodness and mercy. We're not making a long prayer, just touching you. The laying on a fan just to touch you. And I know in the 8 o'clock service, it's just the Pastor Hans and myself, but it's going to be a long time, the two of us. But I'm going to have the prayer warriors come right in and join me right here. I'll just pray and touch you all. That's it. And, and for the others, Pastor Hans and myself, just come right in. And I'm, will you join hands with us just for a moment, just to make contact? Lord, you are touching your people. These precious ones that will now lay hands, you're touching them with your goodness and mercy. Now to everyone here, please remember, I'm not asking you to make a long, windy prayer. I'm not even asking you to pray. Do you understand the difference between prayer and proclamation? Proclamation is not a prayer. Proclaiming is an edict that you speak. And all you are speaking is goodness. I got to pray for healing. That is goodness. I got to pray for prosperity. That is goodness. I got to pray for forgiveness. That is mercy. All we are told to do is just lay hands and say goodness and mercy. This year, this is what you will confess. Now it's your turn. Come forward. And you don't need to wait in line. Just come right in. We just touch you. It's just the proclamation. Goodness and mercy. 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 Yes, Lord, we proclaim goodness and mercy for 2018. Goodness, O God, and your mercy. Goodness upon your handmaid, O God, and mercy in Jesus' name. Goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. Lord, let them receive your goodness and your mercy. Let them receive your goodness and your mercy in Jesus' name. 
Let, O oh God, your people receive your goodness and mercy in Jesus' name. It is your goodness, it is your mercy. That's why we're not consumed. Goodness and mercy, 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 goodness and mercy. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's prepare our hearts now to worship our Father with the tithes and with the offering. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you, God, and we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you even for your word to us again this morning, O oh Father. We thank you for this new year, O oh God. We thank you for your goodness and mercy that should follow us all the days of our lives, Lord. And now, Father, we extend our hand, Lord God Almighty, to worship you with the tithes and with the offering this morning, O oh God. Bless your people, Father, we pray, Father God. We thank you, Father, multiply it back unto us, O oh God, even as we come to the table. Receive this. It has come from you, and we return it to you, O oh God. Through Christ, our Lord, and God's people say, Amen and Amen. Please remember that you can text your offering, especially those of you who are watching by the internet or over the television, you can text your uh, your offering by texting 73256 Highland Giving. 73256 Highland Giving. One word, Highland Giving. God bless.
thing that had breath. Praise the Lord. The psalmist says, praise waited for you. Can you say praise waited for you, Lord? What are we waiting? Let's just praise the Lord. Let everything that had breath praise the Lord. Give the Lord all the praise.
every Sunday as you walk in, you get this bulletin that gives you information of all the events that takes place. There's going to be the celebration of uh, Easter concert and we'll be featuring Naomi Rain. Keep that in mind and the date we're already announcing, it's a ticketed event. Then there's the prayer and fasting from Jan the 15th to the 19th. This is a sabbatical. Ministries come together, and we would be emphasizing the Wednesday. It starts at 7 and closes before 8.30, and we want to emphasize that as well. So this would be moments of prayer, but particularly the 15th to the 19th. And again, at the end, you have the notes which you, uh, in the message that you hear, and it's also found um, in the internet, I believe. Take this moment, if you would, to continue to worship the Lord and uh, uh, browse through these uh, bulletin, their prayer events sometimes mentioned. Anyway, at this moment, we just want to thank everybody, especially on the TV world and uh, internet being with us, and we're going to sign off with you. Thanks for watching us, and we're just taking this moment to be here together here at the Highland Church on a Sunday morning. Thank you, and God bless you. You may be seated just for a moment.